Hi, everyone, and welcome to Your Money Map, sponsored by the Alliance for Lifetime Income. I'm your host, Jean Chatsky. So 2024 is officially here, and so is the Peak 65 Zone. If you are a regular viewer, you know that this is something we've been talking about a lot. This year, we will see the largest surge of Americans in recent history, with more than 4.1 million Americans turning 65 each year, and this is going to last through 2027. That amounts to more than 11,200 Americans hitting that big birthday every single day. A new economic report out just today from the Alliance for Lifetime Income shows that these millions of retiring Americans lack sufficient protected income and face financial insecurity. In fact, one measure suggests about half of these households are at risk of not having enough money saved to maintain their standards of living in retirement. From inflation, to longevity trends, there is a lot to consider when we think about retirement and making our money last. If you are retiring this year or within the next several years, you might be wondering, what can I do to protect myself and my income? Joining me today to answer those questions and unpack exactly what entering the peak 65 zone means for you and for your life, I have amazing guests in the studio with me today. Michelle Singletary is here. She is the personal finance columnist at the Washington Post. Ben Harris, former chief economist with the U.S. Treasury Department, and Jason Fickner, chief economist at the Bipartisan Policy Center and head of the ALI Retirement Income Institute. Thank you guys for joining me in Washington, D.C. Great. Good, Good to be here. here. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. So, Jason, this report that we are talking about, it's yours. You have a new paper being released today. It's called The Peak 65 Zone is Here, Creating a New Reti new Framework for America's Retirement Security. It basically talks about the challenges and the need for a new framework, a new set of rules to make retirement possible for people. Set it up for me. What is this peak 65 zone? Why is it important? Well, as, as you mentioned, Jean, the start of this, we have 4.1 million Americans turning 65 every year starting this year through 2027. By 2030, all the boomers will be 65 or older. And we also at the point where we'll have more people over 65 than under age 18. And that changes the dynamics of our demographics and our financing for basically people who are working versus people who are going to be dependent on social insurance programs and Medicare. So we have a fiscal challenge and a demographic challenge macro, but on the individual side, what that means is you also have people now who are retiring and they're changing from working to retirement and they're going from getting a paycheck when they work, but they no longer have a pension plan. They have, if they're lucky, a 401k plan, but they have to figure out how to manage those assets. And they're used to having some sort of income, but Social Security, we start with a three-legged stool of, of retirement. Right. You had Social Security, you had individual savings, you had an employer pension. Now you basically people are retiring without a pension. We have the 401k generation now. People's individual savings, depending on whether they had enough income or not, might be in insufficient. And Social Security by itself was only designed to replace about 40% of your income. And Social Security, of course, has financial challenges as well. About 2034, the trust funds will be depleted, which means if nothing is done, they can only pay out in benefits what they get in in revenues, and that's about 75%. Uh, let's stick with Social Security for just a second, because I know that a lot of people watching, and Michelle, you must get these questions all yeah. the time, are really worried about is there going to be money there for me? And what does that mean, that depletion? Ben, you were very recently the Assistant Secretary, Treasury Secretary for Economic Policy. You oversaw these programs, Social Security and Medicare, trust funds. What, what, what are the true state of these programs? So as, as Jason mentioned, we expect the trust funds to be exhausted by 2031 if it's the Medicare trust fund, and by 2033 if it's the Social Security trust fund. And then, you know, as he said, at that point, it's, it's money in, money out, and it's around 75% for Social Security, 77%, I think, exactly. But I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, you could get to that point, and Congress could say, look, we're just going to decide to have transfers from the general fund that make everyone whole. That's, I think, a perfectly reasonable assumption. 
Um, but this is sort of an unfortunate source of uncertainty for people. People shouldn't have to worry about this. We should have a fiscal trajectory which is more balanced and more sustainable. Really what's happening because they're aging the population because, uh, and, and we're not replacing uh, uh, workers with through immigration or through higher fertility, is that we're having these really acute fiscal challenges over the next three or four decades. So the Congressional Budget Office projects the debt to go to over 180% of GDP by 2053. And what this means is that as a country, we're going to have to decide we really want to pay for these retirement investments, this retirement spending that we're making through Social Security and Medicare. And you know, that's a question for Congress. But in terms of, of Social Security, uh, I think that the fears are a little overblown. A lot of people think, and Michelle probably gets this all the time, but you, know, you hear from people like, Social Security will not, will not be there for me. That's not an accurate statement. I mean, worst case scenario, probably three-fourths of Social Security will be there for you. Best case scenario, you'll get what you expect. So I think some of the fears are overblown. Yeah. They're overblown, I think, in part because people don't understand the language and, and they don't understand what it means to look at your social security statement and understand, well, maybe I'll only get 75% of that. What do you think we do to quell these fears a bit? Yeah, I think we just have to do a lot of myth busting and watch our language. Was, uh, be careful to not say Social Security is bankrupt um, or it's going to be depleted. Um, I think we need to be very careful how we communicate. There is an issue. It's like any out household. More income coming, less income coming in, more going out. That's really what's happening with Social Security. So it, it's going to be there. It's going to be there for the boomers. It's going to be there for Gen Z. It's going to be there for the millennials. It's going to be there. But how much? So I think what will happen is they may raise the full retirement age. They're going to probably lift the cap. Most people don't even realize that after you make a certain amount of money, you don't, Social Security isn't taken out of your income. So that's great if you make a lot of money, you know, one hundred and forty to two hundred thousand dollars. You you know, you're not going to be paying into the system. I think they'll probably raise the cap. They will fix it. It'll be the 11th hour and they will fix it. Uh, I think the younger generation is going to face probably full retirement, maybe 60, you know, 8, 69, maybe even 70. Uh, and that means that they're going to have to save more because we know that people feel like they can work to that long. Mm -hmm. But the reality is the statistics show that people health reasons, long term care issues with not themselves, just themselves, but with family members. So you want to work. You say, I'm going to work till 70, but you have to retire at 62 because you can't work until 70. So Michelle makes a good point. I think this is to point out and Ben's as well. So Social Security will be there. The question is how much and at what level. And also the peak 65 generation, we talked about them today why it's important, but it's also important for the generations that are coming behind them. Because when we make changes to Social Security, which we will do, there's either going to be an increase in, in taxes, a decrease in benefits, some general borrowing from the general fund, or a combination of the three. Mm -hmm. But if you think about any changes that's likely to happen with retirement age or taxes, that impacts the current workers, the younger workers today. So they're going to pay more and probably get less. And so this is why the framework is important, because even if Social Security is made whole, like if they just do general revenue borrowing and transfers, that still is only designed to replace about 40% of the average American. It is not something you can rely on. And people are used to getting a paycheck. They were used to getting a pension. They don't get a pension. So now we have to figure out how to take that asset they have in a defined contribution plan and turn that into a student protected income on top of Social Security. Well, let me turn that right back to you, because this paper that you've just published lays out a framework for essentially, I mean, the, the overarching problem is we had pensions in this country for many, many years, provided a paycheck, you knew you were going to get it for the rest of your life. Companies went to 401ks. All of a sudden, we have been saving and saving and saving and saving, and now it's on us to take this monster asset and convert it into income without any knowledge about how to do that. And, and that's the challenge. And this is why the framework calls for sort of like a partnership between you know, the government, private sector, and workers, and talking about how we actually then help people design both products and understanding with education about how much they can transfer, how much they need, how do they get that paycheck, how do they take those assets and convert it into, say, like an annuity, for example, so they have protected income. And not one size fits all. There's a lot of different sort of areas out there and different sort of products and solutions. So we need to talk about what they can be. And Michelle mentioned the age 62. So if we, the way Social Security is designed is it's supposed to be actually neutral. 
depending on when you, when you claim. Which what, what does that, that mean? What, what that means is whether you claim at 62 or 70, the benefits, you get a lower monthly benefit at age 62 than you would get at 70. In fact, the age 70 benefit is 77% higher per month than the age 62 benefit. But if you live to the average year, you're going to get less monthly benefit checks if you claim at 70 than you're at 62. So it's designed to be, on average, equal. But, and that's where you're going with, but yes. the higher monthly benefit really helps people in later stages of life because that's the income they might need when they have a health shock or an income shock or something else. So when we start talking about those who have to retire at 62, they are then taking a reduction that's going to last them the rest of the life. It's like a penalty. Uh, Teresa Garaducci at the New School calls anything before age 70 claiming a penalty. The other big factor in this when to claim decision is the fact that we are living a lot longer, not equally. And I, I want to talk to you about that, Ben. But one recent report shows that Americans could be living a total of 12 years longer yeah. by the year 2040. It's exciting. It's terrifying. The work um, that, that you've done at Brookings has really looked at longevity across different economic groups. What are you finding? Yeah, so this is, I think, a really important study by Ann Case and Angus Deaton uh, through a Brookings Journal called the Brookings Papers on Economic Activity. And what they did was they just looked at changes in life expectancy at age 25, which is um, after, basically the reason they chose 25 was because that's how we know whether or not you'll have a bachelor's degree. Most people have either had a bachelor's degree or not at that point. And there are a few lessons that come out of this research. The first is that people are living a lot longer and life expectancy has been going up over time until we got to COVID when it dipped down. But this is wonderful news. I mean, our most precious commodity are days on this earth. And the fact that this is going up over time is just terrific news. The bad news is that there are growing disparities between people with and without bachelor's degrees. So if you go back to 1992, the difference in life expectancy at age 25 between someone with and without a bachelor's degree was about 2.5 years. And uh, you know that's not a huge gap. But by 2020, that had grown to 8.5 years, which is a massive that's gap. That's huge. And this means, this means a few different things. One, this means that we have to start tailoring, unfortunately, financial advice differently to people based on their education status. The second thing I think it means for policymakers is you've really got to start thinking about policies to help people without bachelor's degrees live longer. And you also have to think about policies when you're thinking about Social Security reform that makes sense and are fair to people who are going to expect to live less long. Um, and so, you know, the, the growing disparity really is a tragedy, but the overall growing uh, expansion of life expectancy is, is, tr is a true miracle. But what, what, but, but what the studies, I think, should factor in more is student loan debt uh, and that people, yeah, you know, get a degree, but when does that pay off exactly? And the, the folks that I'm looking at have student loan debt well into their 50s, some right up to the door of 60, if not longer. And so you're getting these degrees, but, and you may be earning some more money, but if you're servicing a lot of debt, it doesn't allow you to save to get that security blanket you need for when you do retire. And then, you know, we've been pushing higher education, but there's a, there's a large part of our population that it just isn't gonna work for them. It's not for them. So we need to create policies that help them as well. You know, uh, um, you know apprenticeships, things like that. You know, my, my son is on the autism spectrum and he's got a college degree and we didn't have debt for him, but he's having a tough time because of his disability finding a job that will help him earn. So now my husband is thinking, well, what do we have to supplement? So we have to factor in those type of things as well. Um, and I think what I'd like people to know is not be scared, but if you're in your 20s, you got to start thinking about how long you're going to live, how you spend your money, and that you're going to have to shave off. Uh, some of that to, to, for retirement. And one of the things that people never want to hear from me because they like, I don't want to leave my parents, is housing. Because that is the biggest, we talk about retirement savings and all that, but what really prevents people from saving is the cost of housing. And that we're spending way too much of our net income on housing, which doesn't allow you to save for retirement. Well, and that's a problem that's just been exacerbated this year with, with interest rates. But to, yeah. to circle back to this 
how long am I going to live question. Mm -hmm. I think that one of the problems with it is that people don't get it, right? If you ask people, there was a, a, a research study done earlier this year, Anna Maria, or last year, Anna Maria, Maria Lusardi at, at GW, basically tested people's knowledge of how long they're gonna live and a, a huge amount of people got it wrong. So how do we get this message across about longevity and what is the important message to convey? Well, and this is, goes back to both what Michelle and Ben are, have been saying. So there's, you know, Ben used the age of 25 for starting to measure longevity because you have longevity from the time a cohort is born and then from a certain age, right? And the, basically the longer you live, the more likely you are to live the next day, which is sort of interesting. Mm -hmm. So when you start thinking about people who get to 60 or 65, they have a longer longevity than someone you might do on average to be staying starting at age one, right? We're looking at a cohort. So what becomes interesting about this and why it's very important, and Michelle mentions about savings, is think of someone who turns 25, and let's say they have a college degree. If they want to retire at 65, whether that's possible or not, that's 40 years of work. You are now looking at having 40 years of work to fund what could be 30, 35 years of retirement. Or more. Or more. And this is where the math becomes challenging and why it's so important to start saving early even a little bit. And we part of this new framework is calling for employers to have more access to retirement plans for their employees because one of the greatest you know, powers in the universe is the power of compounding. And the, more, the earlier you start, and so people who start, I think you might have done a column on this, but the earlier you start, the more you start saving at 25, the more ahead you are if you start saving at 35, right? You get 10 extra years of compounding. So we have to make this more accessible to everybody, lower income, middle income, higher income people. And then with Social Security, Social Security is still going to be the bedrock of retirement for many or most Americans. And the question is, how do we help them like, defer and delay claiming decisions? So you think about the idea of having your retirement assets. It doesn't say you take your 401k and you completely hand over all the assets to somebody for an annuity, but you could take some of it and do what's called a bridge annuity. So if you, were, if you couldn't work past 62, take an annuity that allows you to get some money at 62, 3, 4, 5, or 6, delay claiming Social Security at age 67 or up to 70, which allows you to get a higher monthly benefit that's inflation protected for the rest of your life. This has been a good year for annuities. Annuity sales were, were stronger this year than they have been in quite a while. But I'm guessing that when you start talking about things like bridge annuities, you lose a lot of people. Yeah. Oh, and sure. I, and I'm wondering, what do you think that people need to understand about these products and the place for them? Well, I think uh, cost uh, and how they're sold uh, I was actually working with someone and she didn't even know that she was being pitched an annuity. Uh, and, I, and she was telling me the terms. I said, oh, that sounds like an annuity. And she said, oh, no, it's not an annuity because whoever was pitching it to her never used that word. And I'm sure they didn't use that word because they felt like that person would be scared um, and not understand it. And that is exactly it, it actually what happened. <laughs> and I was like, oh, no, this is annuity. But we, she already had a pension. And so I think the industry has to do a better job of pitching it and selling it to the right people at the right cost at the right time, looking at the totality of of their financial situation. You don't sell me one. I already have a pension. My husband has a pension. We're gonna both have social security and we have healthy 401ks. So we may not be the ideal person, but if you're pitching me and not telling me that it's an annuity, I have a problem with that. But there are a lot of people who need an annuity because they just don't have the capacity nor the inclination to understand how to invest their money to make it last. And I think if we do a better education about that, simplify the terms so that people understand because when you sell it right to the right people it makes sense you don't have to worry about the market and what happens to it you have that in the uh, inflation adjusted in addition to social security then it is right for a lot of people so Michelle just got it exactly right. So we should make sure we tape that, we record it, and play it back. Because she, it's not one size fits all. It's not for everybody. For many people, there is something for them that helps them right. get through retirement, whether it's short term or long term. And that's the important message: is how do we get more protected income? Because mm -hmm. if you ask people, would you like to get a paycheck in retirement? Their answer is yes. That's what they want because they want the budget constraint and the budget certainty that they can spend. And, and the heart of this, from an economic perspective, is uncertainty. 
Right. I mean, it's such fantastic uncertainty for how long you're going to live. And the way we deal with uncertainty is often through insurance. So economists look at annuities like an insurance product, insurance against outliving your assets. Well, see, when you just said like, it is an insurance product. <laughs> see, that, that, that's exactly what it's like. It's it's falling is absolutely. <laughs> It is an insurance product. It, it, it is an insurance product because it's, it's protecting against the risk right. of living too long. Now, that's not a bad thing. A lot of time we think about insurance protecting against bad outcomes. Living into your late 90s is a great thing, but you do need to have a plan in place for dealing with that. And I, I think it's unfortunate that we talk about life expectancy as a single number. Because mm. people have in their head, they're like, okay, my life expectancy is 82, I'm 65, I've got to deal with 17 years of income if I want to retire at 65. That's not the case. I mean. Part of it is living late into your 90s, and for if you're talking to, say, a, a woman in her early 60s, there's a pretty good chance she's going to live into her late 90s. There's also a pretty good chance that she's not going to make it to 70. So how do you deal with that uncertainty? And you're right, Gene. I mean, you know, I've done research looking at people's ability to predict their own mortality, and they're not very good at it. Right. And so, you know, really for me as an economist, the only answer to deal with this fantastic uncertainty is an insurance product like, and the one that I happen to like, are these deferred annuities, like ones you purchase around age 65 and that pay off at age 85. For some people, not those with pensions necessarily, but for others who have liquid wealth, um, it's the only way to deal with this uncertainty. Otherwise, what do you do? You hoard your assets because you don't want to be 95 and needing long-term care. Yeah. Right, and we've seen that. I mean, our colleagues have written about the fact that people who have streams of income, pensions, versus big assets in a 401k are more likely to spend. They spend twice as much because they know that they're going to get that paycheck every single... Hey, don't tell my husband that, though. Can we just keep... Because he wants to spend our money. I just don't, please don't... I hope he's not going to watch. He's not going to watch. He's not going to... He's not going to watch. It's a, it's a complicated puzzle. But I got to say, and, and I think that this is a very female perspective, that's an insurance policy that I'll buy, yeah. right? Because it's, to me, the idea of not, of running out is so much worse than the idea of having enough to live comfortably but not lavishly. So here, here's where all this comes in, right? We have what we call the retirement income challenge, right? How do we create enough income, generate enough income retirement so people can have the standard of living they're accustomed to when they have them they're working or they need when they're retired? Social Security, we talk about Social Security, realize that the technical name for it, OASI, is the old age survivors yeah. Insurance program. It's an old age insurance program. So it, Social Security is insurance. It's pooled insurance that we all pay into and we collect on it again. Some people it's die. It's an annuity. They, it is an annuity. Yeah. Right, and that's right. exactly what it is. And this is the insurance product. So what we're now saying is Social Security is only designed to be about 40% of the average American. We need to have like 70, 75% of total protected income. How do, we, how do we do that gap? How do we fill that retirement income gap? And that's where other annuity products come in. That's where the defined contribution plan, the DC 401k or 403bs, have assets that you can convert some of that into protected income in retirement. And as you mentioned, this gets into like the spending. People either are afraid to spend money because they're not sure how long they're going to live, so they don't spend enough, or they spend too much and they run short. Yeah, right. So what happens when you have this protected income strategy of Social Security and an annuity on top is you now have that paycheck in retirement. You know what economists call your budget constraint. And you then know how much you're getting per month, and that's what you spend, and people feel comfortable with that. And if they have extra that's still in the market, they can weather a storm. So what we've seen with various research, one, David Blanchett, who's at PGM, calls it the license to spend. That when you have this protected income strategy, you know what you can spend, you spend what you get, and you right. feel comfortable doing it, you don't feel like you're missing out. The other, which is also very important, is what's called stay the course. With people who are retired, they have that asset base, and they watch the market fluctuation. Yeah. Every morning, CNBC, market up, market down, and they get nervous. Yes. When markets go down, they do the wrong thing usually, and they sell in a down market. What we have found that for those who have more protected income, they are more comfortable leaving that asset in the market and weathering the storm, they stay the course because they know they've got enough protected income now to pay their bills, and they're comfortable, they're happy, yeah. and secure. Let me layer on a couple of complicating factors to this equation. The first one being consumer debt. We've been reading the headlines, you've been writing the headlines that that show consumer debt is is at 
a record high. Credit card debt is way up. Savings, the, the amount of savings that people have that they accumulated through the pandemic in part thanks to the stimulus programs in part because we just weren't going anywhere, that has evaporated for many families. How does consumer debt figure into this puzzle, Ben? So I think it's important to distinguish between good and bad debt. Oh. And uh, <laughs> uh, 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 Michelle like hates all debt. <laughs> we should just get yeah. <laughs> so there is. Well, look, I mean, uh, look, I think you can look, for example, we talked about student loans. I mean, the economic research on student on going to college is that for most people at most institutions, getting a college degree will increase your, your earnings and exponentially over the course. For me, taking on student debt in most circumstances is a good investment. That's good debt. Housing debt is often good debt. I would never recommend to someone wait till you can pay for a whole house before you buy it, right? Take that mortgage debt, which is typically very low rate debt, has right. tax advantage, take it on early. That's a good plan. The Boston College Center for Retirement Research did some, look in, look, uh, did some investigation into older Americans' debt. And the, you do see this big increase over the past 30 years in households that are age 65 and older that have debt. Part of that is low-risk households that have a lot of assets and some income taking on a lot of low interest rate mortgage debt, which you can debate whether or not it's a good idea, but you can make a strong case as financially savvy. But a lot of the increase in debt are from households that are at risk who are taking on non-secured debt. So this is, this is not auto loans that you, know, you, can, you have this asset. This is not a house. This is credit card debt and medical debt and other types of debt that they don't really have the income to pay back. So there is a problem with older households getting on to age 65 and older. And it's not just low-income households. I mean, part of it is low-income households, but part of it is also households that have a lot of wealth that just seem to be overspending. So it's a very complicated situation. It is a concern. It is going up over time. Yeah, OK, so I'm just going <laughs> to. <laughs> there is no such thing as good debt or bad debt. It's just debt, and, and yes. Most Americans cannot buy a house without debt. Many, many people can't go to school without debt. But when we attach a positive adjective to debt, it makes people feel comfortable, too comfortable in borrowing. There used to be a time when you used to have mortgage burning parties. I, rem I remember that my grandmother, one of her happiest days is when she paid off her mortgage before she retired. That was her goal. I'm going to pay off my mortgage before I retire. And now we have financial people and people in the market say, oh, you got this low mortgage. You know, don't pay it off. But what is the most uh, the, uh, percentage wise in your budget, what do you pay for most on your budget is housing. If you remove that loan from your budget and you still got to pay property taxes, that is going to make that income stretch longer. And so I just abhor people saying good debt, bad debt. It's just debt. And lots of families are spending too much for college. I went to the University of Maryland at College Park and people, you know, say, oh, well, what have you got into Harvard? Wouldn't you go to Harvard? Absolutely not, because I didn't have Harvard money. I didn't send my kids to a, 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 a trendy school or a private Ivy League school because my husband and I didn't have that kind of money. And because we had the um, idea that debt was not a good thing, and so we were going to send them where we can afford. They all went to state schools. None of them graduated with debt, and one of them has a master's, no debt, and she's a social worker, therapist. She's going to be able to save more, and she is. She's saving 15% of her salary, and she's uh, investing in a non-retirement account. And so I really want the messages that for everybody, particularly high net worth individuals, because they've taken all this debt into retirement, and that's why they're scared. That's why they sell off when the market is down, because they get scared, because they want to, they've got all this debt to service. And I think we got to be very careful about telling people about that. Um, and, and take on debt to go to college, okay, if you have to. But if you don't have to, don't do it. And don't drag a mortgage into retirement. Your retirement income will last longer if you do not have a mortgage in retirement. Yeah, so I will say, I, I agree that don't necessarily think that a Harvard education will deliver more than University of Maryland. But I worry a lot, and, there, and the economic research bears that out. But I worry a lot about people not going to college because they don't want to take on debt. Yeah. For most people, that's a really bad decision which will haunt you for the rest of your life. So let me, let me try to crosswalk between the two because <laughs> the best answer in economics is always it depends. Right? And when thinking about, Michelle said a word, a phrase that Ben then repeated, it's debt service. 
So it's debt servicing costs. Forget the good, the bad, because you can make the investment choice about what's good debt, and, and the economists can do that. But if you end up making that bet and you fall short in your income, you're now short and you got services debt. So think about debt servicing. I remember the distinction with housing and autos, right? A house is basically a, a really good, secured, potentially an asset that grows over time. A car depreciates, right? Finance 101, you lease depreciating assets, you buy appreciating assets. And I remember when I went to buy my first car, my dad said, the salesperson's gonna ask you, how much do you want to pay a month? Yeah. And the answer is zero. zero. <laughs> I want to pay zero, right? And then they laugh and like, no, shit. I'm like, zero. So then they start working with you because if you give them a number, $300 a month, they will find some way to stretch out the financing terms or some sort of deal. But the reason this is important is housing. That's what we do in housing. People say, oh, because mortgage rates have dropped, you can afford a larger home now. You can afford $2,000 a month in payment. We don't purchase the home based on our needs, we purchase on it based on that monthly affordability. And this gets to Michelle's point about the education and why that's so important when thinking about debt and assets. Yeah, well even with, I'm sorry Jay, but even with a house, we, we treat, you know, I do my network statement fairly often. I don't really even think of that as part of my network because how do you get to that money? You either have to sell, then where are you going to live? Or you borrow it and then you create more debt. And so you have to be careful about not counting that house as part of your net worth because it is a false uh, security for you. So you, you've, got, you've got this exercise, right? So for an economist, housing is both consumption and investment. And I'm, I'm with Michelle for financial security. You should think about it as consumption. Right. And anything else, if you get it in the end, is just gravy. Right. I actually think of a house as forced savings. I think paying a mortgage over time is a way to build another asset that you might be able to tap in retirement when it comes to paying for things like long-term care, right? I mean, I, I think it's somewhere somewhere in the middle. We could debate that all day. We're not going to do, we're not going to do that because I want to talk about the economy. We've got economists here. Let's talk Let's talk about where we are right now and the likelihood that these changes that you're asking for actually come to pass. Mm. Michelle mentioned earlier she thinks we're going to go to the 11th hour before we make these changes on Social Security. And yet, in the last couple of years, we've had some, last few years, we've had some real movement in terms of laws passed that are beneficial, the SECURE Act 1 and SECURE 2.0, beneficial when it comes to retirement security. What's your, what, what are you hopeful for and what do you think is not gonna change? So I am hopeful for us as a country putting in place uh, laws which put us on a path to long-term fiscal sustainability. I wanna worry less about the debt to GDP ratio uh, I spent a lot of my time worrying about it. You can look at the statistics, like I said at the beginning, having these like almost 200% debt to GDP ratios, which is really high as a country we've never experienced before. I'd also like us to address the social security problem, not the 11th hour, in part because, I mean, Michelle said this earlier, and it's exactly right, which is you can get to a pretty decent solution with social security by a few common sense reforms. And if you, so right now, when social security, when you look at all the wages in the economy, what share is taxed, under the payroll tax, it's about 82%. It was intended to be about 90%. So if you bump up that cap, right now it's what, about 160 or right. so, if you bump it up so it covers 90% of wages, and you bump up the retirement age uh, to age 70, that closes about two thirds of the gap. That buys us a couple generations of solvency for Social Security. It's not, like, it's not some crazy solution. We know the solutions. Except that France, Right? I mean, <laughs> we were all watching France and, and the, the people taking to the streets with the suggestion that they bump up the retirement age. And, yeah. and we've got politicians on Capitol Hill who want to maintain their seats at everybody else's peril. Exactly, and the last time we did this was 1983, and we're still seeing that law be implemented. I mean, it's a tough thing to do. I don't want to discount how difficult it is. Academically, it's easy for me to sit here and point to like Congressional Budget Office projections and say, just do one and two. Politically, it's very difficult, so I, I definitely get that. But there, but we've been, you know, too many years where the sacrifice has been additional debt, and and at some point that's going to come home to roost, and I worry about that. So let me add on to something Ben said, because Ben's recently left the Department of Treasury and now is at Brookings, and so he was overseeing at Treasury what's called the Social Security Working Group for the trust funds for Social Security and for Medicare. 
back in the late 2000, 2008, I was the Deputy Commissioner of Social Security. So I was actually the mm. Secretary of the Board of Trustees and actually had to sign three of those reports. Back under President Obama, if we had just raised and gotten rid of the payroll tax cap, so it's uncapped for Medicare, but it's capped for Social Security, if we had done that in 2008, that would have solved the 75-year okay. solvency. Right. Now, to Ben's point, it doesn't get you. It gets maybe 40%. You've got to add that in with retirement. If we wait to the 11th hour, the change is that delta gets even larger. And Ben also mentioned the 83 reforms, which increased the retirement age. They were phased in over 40 years. We are now getting to that point today where we're now hitting age 67 for people like us. Is that's our full retirement age. So if we start waiting to the 11th hour and do changes, they're going to be so incremental that we're going to have to have intergovernmental transfers, borrowing, and some combination of tax increases and benefit cuts because we've lost our options to do other things. And that's the importance of why we have to do this now and why we're doing this paper now, because this is the moment, right? This is where we have so many people turning 65 and we have a 10 year window to get this done. For this peak 65 zone, look, it would be very nice if the government could step up and do something in the near term to solve this problem. but. In the absence of that, what we need to do is to encourage individuals to control the things they can control and start saving a little more for themselves. How do we do that? Well, and it's also, this is Michelle's point about education, but also employers have a big part of this. So when you do surveys about who do people trust, they surprisingly do trust their employers. And they look to their employers for these retirement plans and for health care. And so we need to make sure that a lot of people have more have access to retirement plans. And that employers actually, you know, one of the biggest things is auto enrollment and then a match. And those two things could go a long way. So as an employer, I would ask employers to look at their benefit package and see where they could help design something better so people have access to a plan and have some sort of match in auto enrollment, maybe even auto escalation. Ben's done a lot of work on this. He's got a book, so he can talk more about this. But that's where the partnership comes in. It's Secure Act 1 and 2. What can the government do on public policy to encourage these and make lower the barriers? Where can employers help? And then where's the role of the employee to step up and actually take participation? I agree. The escalation is a really important part because people have heard, they've got the message. If you talk to most employers, the majority of their employers are in their retirement plan. It's just that they're not in there enough. Mm -hmm. If the if the if the uh, the bottom is two or three percent, that's where they stay. And we know uh, Fidelity Investments, for example, said you got to do about fifteen percent of your gross pay. Well, first of all, that's a lot for a lot of people, but over your career, you can hit that mark. Um, and then more education. Um, you know, I talk to people who have a 401k. They don't, they don't I'll ask them something, they'll say something to me like, oh, I want to be in the stock market. And the first question I ask you is, do you have a workplace with private pay? Oh, sure. Are you invested in it? Oh, sure. It's like, well, you're in the stock market. So that means they don't understand what they're doing or how they're investing is too conservative. Right. for them to, to, to for the grow that money. And then the health care piece, we have got to get away from people having health care through their employer. That is, and that goes back to policy. And I think what you said was so true. It's very difficult, and I get so emotional and stuff, because we have to do the policy and the personal responsibility together. Right. Because until we get the policy, you've got to do better with what you have. And for a lot of people, that is really difficult. All three of my young adults are living with me, not because they couldn't get an apartment, they don't have student loan debt, because I, my husband and I said, listen, stay home. And we're talking not just a couple of years, five, six, seven, ten years. Save the majority of your pay when you are ready to launch. You will probably be able to buy your house close to outright. And now that's a game changer. All your income can go towards saving for retirement. But my son is about to lose health care under our policy. He's about to turn 26. Mm -hmm. and now I'm trying to figure out how to cover him. Right. Right. And there are a lot of people who have jobs and they part a couple part time jobs with no health care. Right. There's and a, that is the difference. There is. There's a there's a whole group of people who are not protected by these policies. I, I want to come back before we wrap this up to your paper. The paper contains a number of recommendations. I want to make sure that we cover them. So what else is in there? And then I'm going to come to both of you. And, and I'd like to talk about what are your specific recommendations for this peak 65 generation? I mean, we've covered a lot in the conversation. And again, it's the idea of thinking about this as a partnership between employers, employees, and the government. And one is reducing the barriers to annuitization and defined contribution plans, which Secure Act 1 and 2 has done. Let's implement those, see how employers do, how plan sponsors do, 
And if need be, we can do secure 3.0. But let's see how 1 and 2 get implemented and what problems and challenges we have. That's one. Employers step up again, making sure they have a plan, get people enrolled, auto-enrolled, escalation. And employers need to look at how also taking now. So most people use a target date fund when they invest, yeah. right? So basically the allocation shifts. We've got to start talking about protected income as an asset class. So people start getting used to this as they're saving from the time they start a job at 24. So when they retire, they've seen their portfolio shift to have some protected income. They don't have to turn money over. They're already expecting to get some additional protected income on top of Social Security. That's part of it. And then better products and solutions in education, thinking about bridge annuities or trial annuities. A lot of people are afraid to surrender over money to get a paycheck. It's like, what if I get hit by a bus tomorrow? I don't know how long I'm going to live. But what if we do a two-year trial? So you get an annuity, you try it out for two years. If you, after two years you don't like it, you can get the rest of your money back. If you like it, the idea is you'll stay into it because now you're used to getting that paycheck. So these are sort of the ideas we're calling for. Better products, better solutions, better education. But think about the role of employers, employees, and the government working together to get this done. And specifically in those retirement plans, these products are coming. Yes. Some are already there and some will have to be designed and they can work with employers and plan sponsors to get the right mix because not one size fits all. But this is happening in Secure Act 1 and 2. We've seen more changes legislatively in the retirement landscape in the past five years than we have since... 20? Yeah. <laughs> PPA 06. And, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so this, one, this is One great. provision in 2.0 that I love is that if employees adopt it, and I really wish you would, that if you have student loan debt, if you're paying a student loan debt, they can match that amount that you're paying in a loan to your retirement account. So that way, because I encourage people to not do that, not put money in if you've got a massive amount of student loan debt, pay that debt down. But now you've got a, a, a provision that would allow them to match the loan payment, and that's a best case scenario for me. And, and that is where you get the role of the government, right, mm -hmm. right doing policy, the employer and the employee working together to say the employee has a need, the employer wants to do it, the government has now stepped in to facilitate through a tax advantage that's how right. they can do it. Exactly. And the same with, with emergency funds and, yeah, emergency and, and those those uh, yeah. those changes. Michelle, you're you're talking so let me stick with you. <laughs> what else what else do you recommend for this peak? 65 generation? Well, you know, just looking not just at yourself, but your children and making sure you have an estate plan in place. Um, and um, we're in the process of doing, uh, redoing our will with our young adults. It's a hilarious process because uh, my kids don't want my house or my ashes. So. <laughs> <laughs> For the right price, I'll take both. <laughs> I know, right? So we wanted to keep the house, uh, and uh, my oldest was like, "Nope, we're going to sell it and split it, and then we can take that money and pay, you know, to pay down our mortgage." Which, at the end of the day, I thought was really smart. Um, and so, just more education. I can't emphasize that enough. Um, we have been using terms and talking about things that if you quiz people, they would have no idea what we're talking about. And I know that it's a heavy lift to understand this. And as I deal with individuals, they don't understand what a, what a rollover IRA is. They don't understand. They think it's the investment instead of the bucket. Right. You know, they don't understand the importance of escalating. If you've got 1% when you get that raise, just keep it, keep going at it. They don't understand that annuity is an insurance product. They don't understand Social Security is an insurance product. And that's why we don't get legislative move because people feel like they put money into a pot that's their pot. Yes. And you better not touch my pot. It's not your pot. It's just like when you buy auto insurance. That money is not just for your car. It's to insure all the cars out there to protect you. And we've got to get people to understand these terms so that if we understand them, then we are not so looking at it so selfishly. It is the most important thing to get this Social Security right, not just for you, but for your neighbors and the rest of the country. Because if we are all having enough to live a decent life, you won't have this huge income gap. And you won't have people at the higher end saying, don't touch Social Security, don't do this. And the, at the detriment to the people at the other end. You won't have people having to spend so much of their income that they get from a college education, paying that debt off. We'll have college, affordable colleges, and apprenticeship programs and things like that. We put all of that in place, we all benefit. A hundred percent. Ben, last word to you. So I agree with Michelle that it is so confusing for people. I mean, I have a PhD in economics, was chief economist at Treasury. When I wrote that chapter on annuities, 
for the book that Jason mentioned, it was really tough because the, the, the words were just unfamiliar to me. The phrases were unfamiliar, multiple phrases that meant the same thing. So A, I think the education is a big part of it and teaching people what they need to, not, what they need to know, not necessarily teaching theoretical concepts from, yes. from textbooks. I agree with Jason that the uh, private sector absolutely has to be a partner in this. Employers have a very strong reputation for being providers of uh, reliable providers of health insurance and other other forms of insurance. And you, I hope that employers continue to be a partner. One thing we did not talk about is tax policy. So every year we have about two hundred fifty billion dollars in tax expenditures that go to savers. These are people putting money in four hundred one k's largely. It is completely upside down because of the way the tax benefit was structured. So those at the top tend to get the bulk of this $250 billion. The Secure 2.0 Act had a provision in there that made a slight, slight improvement around the fairness of these. So people who put money in through what's called the savers credit will get a bit of a plus up. But we need more of that. So people who are benefiting from these auto enrollment programs get a bigger tax benefit for every dollar they put in. That's one big reform we'd love to see from Congress. Fantastic. So many interesting things to follow up on. Thank you all for coming in today. Thanks for engaging in this dialogue. Thank you for writing the paper on Peak Thank 65. You. Which is online at protectedincome.org, by I the way. I was just going to tell everybody. <laughs> <laughs> the plug. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you all for watching. If you'd like more information on this program, you can always visit our website. It's protectedincome.org. And for more information on this show in particular, protectedincome.org slash Harris dash Fickner dash Singletary. We'll put it up there so you can find it. Bye, everybody. <laughs>